Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Second Act Actors. I'm your host, Dr. Janet McMorty, and I'm still a medical doctor simultaneously trying to pursue a career in acting. If you're watching this on YouTube, you will notice things look a little bit different. I still got my same old plain gray background, but I'm literally holding my microphone in my hand. I just moved and I have yet to set up my new recording studio space. Why do we accumulate so much junk in our lives? Oh my goodness. And of course, the last thing to unpack is my studio space. And it's the thing that I needed, you know, almost instantaneously once I moved. Anyways, regardless, this episode is fabulous. Fabulous. My guest this week is Chris Soucy. Chris was a member of the U.S. Army. So he's a veteran. Thank you, my friend, for your service. My goodness. Turned actor, writer, puppeteer, and director. Oh my goodness. This episode is unreal. He is a storyteller. He loves storytelling and just story in general in all the definitions of the word, how we pass stories down through generations, what we should be doing as a community of artists, as human beings on this planet. Oh, this episode is so, so, so juicy and filled with incredible words of wisdom that I love. You know, I love the words of wisdom. Oh my gosh, please enjoy this incredible episode and please enjoy Chris Susie. feel this about when I was signing this NDA, I was like, is this really that important? In the state of the world being on fire, I'm literally signing my life away for whatever this is that really doesn't have that much of an impact on climate change. You know, like, it's just, it's just weird, the importance and the... Right. But is it that important? This is so much documentation when, when a simple don't talk about this sign here should, yeah. you know, should suffice, you know, uh, but I guess, you know, every, every paragraph is because someone screwed up. I always laugh at, you know, we, we joke about, you know, why does it say caution hot on the cup of coffee that you get handed? Right. Like, there's a reason why. And there's a reason why I have to sign this. Well, there's a reason why there's a picture of someone being crushed by a vending machine on every vending machine, you know, and, and you do not eat on those little silicone packets you find, you know, in your leather jacket. You're like, so I pull a silicone packet on my leather jacket. And the first thing I think is, oh, candy. Ooh, a tasty snack. That was kind of them. <laughs> my jacket came with food. That's great. <laughs> I'm so glad they knew I would be hungry. They knew, they I'd, knew be I'd be hungry after buying, <laughs> after buying, you know, this. They're putting, you know, a couple hundred dollars down on this jacket. They, they put an itty bitty little thing as a treats in my pocket. So yeah. kind of Danye Leather to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really thought this one out. I, I think also about, you know, I, yeah, I kind of have to like check myself when I'm when I was signing these things being like, oh, for God's sake, this is so silly. Like literally we're having, you know, this discussion. But then, you know, this is so millions and billions of dollars and millions, not, maybe not millions, but a lot of people's jobs, right? So oh, yeah, 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 this big fandom or whatever, this this video game, this series or whatever, yeah, will it change the fact that the world is on fire? No, but it significantly no. impacts so many human beings because it's their livelihood. I'm like, yes, just check yourself. Oh, sure. And, you know, it's funny because I think right on the, on the very tip top of reasons to do this, you know, is... Um, to make the world a better place, you know, uh, regardless, you know, you are, you are contributing. And so when you think of, no, it's not going to change. <laughs> it's not going to have any effect on climate change. It's not going to do anything. It's like, well, actually everything we do is about uh, a quality of life, hmm. you know, um, and, and people forget that art is essential they tend to believe that it is frivolous and, and you can absolutely see that by like, you know, policy. You know, the first thing is to get cut. You know, mm -hmm. people are like, oh, well, art is frivolous and art, art doesn't mean anything. It's like, oh, really? Well, tell me what the gross national product of Egypt was. 
you know, can you can you tell me anything about Egypt outside of what we see in their art mm -hmm. and what they what we see in their beautiful architecture and, 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 and their achievements? You know, we don't know much about any culture other than their art. Mm -hmm. Their art is supposed to encapsulate it, it's supposed to, you know, promote it, it's supposed to inspire it. And people forget that. People <laughs> people are so quick to say, no, you know, this is the first thing to go so that we can focus on the real important things. And it's like, well, no. Uh, the real important things is that as human beings, we must express ourselves. And I think a big part of it is is storytelling, mm. right? Like you were saying, like like art, it, art is storytelling. All art is storytelling, yeah. All art and all history yep. and all culture, right? How we have made, like you were saying, the history of, of Egypt, of anyone, or like how we even let others in the world know for generations to come about the technology that we made, about STEM, about everything, is the storytellers who will write it down, who will film it, who will you know, whatever futuristic storytelling devices there will be right. in the future, that's how they'll TikTok about it, right? That is, that's the way that our culture, uh, what's the word, S like sustains itself. It stays. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, it is, uh, it's funny because it does come to that weird conversation where you're like, you know, is not the point of, of living to express and to, you know, convey the message of, of life to the next generation and the next generation and the next generation, um, regardless of, you know, whatever tasks or jobs or things that we have in our lives, we're trying to build some kind of foundation that will hopefully, you know, and, and, and if that is to sit down with your kid and, and make up a fun story to entertain them in the wee hours of the night so that they'll go to sleep or making a, you know, $300 million movie they, they, they are linked intrinsically with the human condition, with the idea mm -hmm. that we have to express ideas from one person, the, the storyteller, to the other person, the audience. And uh, to be any part of that cycle is so vital and wonderful and amazing, you know, and, 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 and should be, you know, a, um, a requirement of, of mm. everybody to learn uh, the simple art of storytelling, uh, and, and mind you, some of the greatest storytellers I have ever met were in no way involved in the arts as a whole. They were just very good at encapsulating their sensations and their feelings, and they'll you know sit at the bar and just tell you a story that happened to them, you know. And they they are flawless storytellers because they they have such a sound uh, understanding of who they are. And then when they convey who they are in, an, in a situation, it's so entertaining and it's so wonderful. And you could just listen to them for, you know, the entire uh, evening. And I, I think that's what all storytellers should strive to do is be so sure of themselves and who they are that they can convey the story across in such a comfortable and, you know, uh, uh, effective manner. Oh, I think about a lot of the good storytellers like that that what you were saying just brought up so many of the people in my in my life and who I've come across who are such good storytellers and my my immediate uh, thought is going like to my extended family in Ireland who like you're like just sit oh, around the pub. Like, an the Irish, Irish storyteller these, is yeah. Oh my god, right? Like there's a reason why their culture and their their songs and it is so rich. But I also what I think a big part of who these great storytellers are because there's a storyteller and then there's someone who makes every conversation about themselves <laughs> and right and so they're sure, they're sure, sure. technically telling a story but you're kind of being like okay uh -huh. but then there's the storyteller who is inclusive of others and I think storytelling when done well not only are they confident in themselves and their story but they're also empathic to the people around them because i think how we bring empathy is like the only way we learn about others is the stories that we tell to others and they tell to us right absolutely and and, and yeah that's such a, a good point is you know um the difference is are you telling a story or are you talking you know hmm. because a story generally is framed it has a point. It has a conveyance. You know, when you're just talking about yourself, 
it is not it that is not a story. You know, you can listen to a, a story or you or you can listen to somebody talk. And when somebody talks, it 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 can get very uh, monotonous or mundane or or you know, it, it, it's oftentimes in talking you're just conveying small bits of information, and then if somebody's just talking you know a lot about nothing in particular, <laughs> you know, uh, you, you find yourself kind of like you know uh, glazing over and and losing sight of whatever they were talking about because that becomes you know the the issue. Because uh, it, it translates to to acting and and to to performance of any type, is um, are you carrying the information in uh, its frame and its format to the audience, or are you just up there moving around and saying things? You know, uh, it, it it and you can always tell the difference between an actor who is self serving and an actor who is serving the story, who is serving you know the project whatever it is and that becomes like this this interesting thing it's like how do you tell a bad actor from a good actor uh you know and that and that conversation is huge you know when you when you're watching like a movie and you're like ah that guy's just a terrible actor it's like well what makes him a terrible actor it's more than likely and you know my opinion here uh, (laughs) but it's more than likely that they're thinking of themselves they're thinking of themselves portraying this role they are they haven't gotten past themselves and that is what we see we see them struggling to be someone else they, they're not embodying a character they're not you know fulfilling their obligation as an actor they are uh i used to i used to liken it to you know uh, people who act there are people who act who think they're putting on a suit and no one sees them you know they're putting on like a costume and, and all they see is the costume. And so they're inside the costume, you know, like puppeteering, thinking that you can't see them. It's like, you know, uh, being in, in a Mickey Mouse costume, but not smiling inside the suit. And it's like, if you're not smiling inside the suit, you can kind of tell, but we can see you. <laughs> you're not in a costume. You're not in a, you know, you're not being, there's not something between the audience and you. And if you can't accept that it's up to you to convey the feelings, the emotions, to 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 take that extra distance. You know, um, the the greatest uh, compliment you ever hear for an actor is uh, you make it look so effortless. You make it, you know, you, you, you're you're so good. You know, um, and, and and you're a natural. You know, it's natural. Uh, I think it was Denzel Washington was once told that he just, you know, you, you just look so good. And he's like, yeah, I worked really hard. <laughs> To get to that place where it looks good, you know, where where it looks natural, where it looks comfortable, where, you know, uh, that's that's what study does. That's when you when you go to the acting classes, when you do do those things, is you're trying to break down the uh, the visibility of the actor at work. You know, the actor is 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 piloting the character, and you don't want to see the actor at work. You want to see the character. Um, and sometimes you'll even say that you were you can get pulled out <laughs> of, of of a great performance by how good it is. You know how how often have you watched something that was so brilliant that you had to stop and go, "That guy's just acting his butt off." You know that guy's incredible, or you know that woman just just tore it up. You know, it's just chewing up the scenes. It's like, yeah, but did they take you out of the story? You know, uh, that is a, a, a delicate balancing act, really. And I think that's why, actually, I don't think, I don't know, that's why it's really hard to be a successful actor. Yes, absolutely. Because, like, yeah, of course there are those people you can socially influence your way into a multi-bajillion dollar um, film and be famous, but... It's so rare to find those actors who do exactly that to like your soul <laughs> to sound dramatic, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, one of my favorite uh, lines. So one of my favorite actors of all time was Peter O'Toole. Um, and I would dare say it was because I just loved looking at his face. Like his face said so many things. Just looking at him, I was like, oh, that guy is so interesting looking. He's, 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 he's so beautiful. It's, it's just so incredible. But he was in a movie called My Favorite Year. And uh, somebody 
offhandedly, he, he's just playing like this aging movie star. And, and, and somebody was like, well, you know, you're an actor. He's like, I am not an actor. I am a movie star. And I was like, that is a great distinction. You know, that is, that is part of this, this journey of the art of acting is how it, how it started, how it had to transcend so many mediums. And, you know, in the early part of the 20th century, so many actors were caught in a, am I, 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 I'm acting like I'm on stage, but there's a camera, you know, and, and, and as you watch, uh, emotional realism slowly rear its head in those movies, it was, they were totally different beings, totally different creations. You know, there was a time when everybody talked like this and they were in the movies and here we are. And now I'm this character and everything's going great. And now, uh, because they were, they were doing sort of this, uh, persona that they equated to being on film. And, uh, you know, there's this huge movement, uh, you know, the, the method actors and, uh, you know, uh, 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 to break away from the rigors of classical training and classical stage. Because on top of the, uh, the new medium of film was this idea that theater itself was stagnating, that people on stage were presenting more than they were acting and they were presenting more than they were feeling. And... Um, and I just find that endlessly fascinating to, to really think about is, is there was an evolution to the medium. And, there's, and, and I think there's a new evolution coming that we're right on the cusp of seeing a new evolution, which is like um, the augmented reality or the, uh, the 360 ability to, to film or to tell stories. And, you know, I think moving forward, that's going to become more and more of an issue is you're never off screen. Like you're going to, it's going to come to a time when there are no cuts because people can just look at you. You know, if you're there, you know, you'll be able to turn and look at an actor who's not speaking or doing anything, but you're going to have to remain in character, remain in space, you know, and it's more like stage acting at that point. I was about to say, it's like theater again. Right. Well, you know, and I think that that's going to be an interesting thing about theater is being able to like drop a 360 camera on the stage of a theater. And having people act and interact around it, and now people at home can watch a live theater event, but not from not from the audience, but from the stage. And I think that there's going to be more and more things like that, live, you know, uh, performances, because living theater is uh, is is a difficult thing right now because it it does smack a little of elitism. You know, uh, only a very small fraction of the audience is going to see the best of it. You know, only a, a very small fraction of the population gets to see a Broadway show on its original run with its original cast, you know, um, because even even if you do make it to Broadway, it may take you years to get there. And that original cast has been, you know, replaced or, or reworked or, you know, and not to say that that's bad in any sense. But I do believe that the fervor of theater and the fervor of of the creative art of, of live theater has been kind of uh, uh, marketed in such a way that many people just think it's inaccessible, that it's impossible to see. And so, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that like with the trend of, um, of Hamilton on Disney Plus and um, Come From Away uh, is on uh, Apple TV. Um, and these are the, li- and I know that every Broadway show has a professional video, like, uh, for those of you out there in the world, uh, if you go to New York City, you can go to the, uh, the Lincoln Center, I believe, and watch any Broadway play that has been produced in the last like 20 plus years. You can watch it fully produced uh, uh, with a video because they did it for archival purposes and they keep it there. So you can go and check it out like a library book and sit and watch it. And it's, it's, it's an amazing resource, but the fact that it exists, the fact that it's out there, makes me think that we need to be giving this to, you know, everyone. Everyone deserves to see what, what, the, the, what the greatest minds in theater are uh, capable of, what the greatest performers of theater are capable of. Um, and generally, you know, I do believe that, that there's a culmination of talent that happens, you know, when you get to Broadway. And my, I believe all regional theaters have 
exquisite talent and community theaters even have exquisite talent. But, uh, but because when you go to a community theater, what you're usually seeing is the shoestring budget, <laughs> the, 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 the blood, sweat, and gumption, which I love, by the way. Uh, I would never, ever downplay community theater. Uh, I'm just saying that a lot of people will never see a full-scale, completely realized production um, because it's cost-prohibitive. It's not just cost-prohibitive. We're not all going to fit on that island uh, in New York, <laughs> we're not going to fit in those theaters. So uh, I think that that there needs to be a way to not because it's not about preserving the art. Stories should not be um, uh, recorded and then hidden in a vault. They, they need to be you know uh, people need to see it and be inspired by it. Yeah, and I think about the advent of all these streaming services, right? Mm. Like I know um, up here in Canada, we're, we have something called the Stratford Festival, which is the like big Shakespeare festival. Oh, yeah. put, and they have their own streaming service. The National Theatre over in London has their streaming service. The National Theatre is, is leading the way with that streaming service. Oh, it's amazing. It's so amazing. And... I mean, there's still obviously a cost associated with it, but the amount of people who didn't even know it was a thing that I'm oh. telling people about, they're like, what? I can see, you know, uh, Ray Fiennes in, his, in a play doing... Yeah. Benedict Cumberbatch's uh, Frankenstein. Frankenstein. Yeah. Like, it's, it's incredible. And it's interesting, I think, as well, because not only does it... Not only does it op- like bring theater to the masses, <laughs> it also expands people's idea of like what acting is oh absolutely yeah. you don't think about theater that much anymore you're like wait a second that's that's benedict Cut. that's dr strange that's dr yeah, strange that's dr strange <laughs> and, and and it's so interesting because they always talk about the 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 functionality of, of an actor in different mediums you know um and and they will tell you that you know in in film uh, a lot of credit needs to go to the editor <laughs> And a lot of credit mm-hmm. go to the DP and the director because what you see is a manipulated situation. And, and, and the actor's, of course, brilliant. Uh, but on stage, you, that is an actor's domain. You know? uh, and, and I think a lot of people underestimate how much an actor's sway on stage really is because we've gotten used to film and, hmm. you know, but, you know, to, to stand in front of a live audience and, and really command an audience and, and really pull it through. And and what what people don't realize is that our, our great movie actors, many of them have firm foundation in in the stage. And so when you see Ian McCullen and Patrick Stewart doing, you know, Waiting for Godot and you're like, whoa, that was insane. That's incredible. You know, um, you see uh, so many amazing uh, movie actors have a passion and a and a you know true uh, uh, respect and love for theater for for stage theater and, and it's 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 a great way to to talk to people about the path to being an actor because the path mm-hmm. to being an actor is a weird windy road and you know a lot of people start thinking I got to go to Hollywood or I got to go you know I I've, I've, I've got to take this path that is set, you know, uh, that has a, a definitive answer. You know, um, I've got to be on Broadway. I've, I've got to be in, in New York. Uh, I've got to be in Hollywood. I've got to be, you know, now it's Atlanta. I've got to be in Atlanta. I've got to do these things. And it's like, well, movies are made everywhere. You know, and, 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 and not just independent films. You know, major films come to just about every corner of the world to tell their stories. Which means that you need to be paying attention to that that local and regional, you know, mm-hmm. th- scene. And one of the cl- cleanest and clearest ways paths to to that is to get involved with local actors, local production offices, local. You know, um, every city has you know so, some some nutty person who is going to make a movie, and you can be a part of it. You can you can reach out. Uh, uh, and there are a lot of interesting little festivals. Um, I know that the 48-hour film festival, have you ever participated in one of those? I haven't, but we just had the Toronto one. It was last weekend. It's so amazing. Uh, and, and I met uh, many of my filmmaking you know, uh, 
co-conspirators <laughs> doing 48 hour films because you know it, it, you create a team and 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 a, and, a, and a good crew and a good cast you become family very quickly and you just want to you want to keep that relationship going you want to do more with them and so you start coming up with projects and you start you know uh traveling in packs and trying to make things happen um, so, you know, if you're out there listening and thinking that there's no no way in, look look for the nearest 48 hour film, because that's a bunch of like minded people who are doing it, you know, sheerly out of the passion for it. And you can find people who are. At the very least producing on the smallest level, but at the very most aspiring to great things. Tell me about your path. How did you get, you wear many hats in this industry. Tell me about your journey. Uh, so it, it's, it's interesting because I was, you know, I was, I was a drama theater kid, you know, in, in school. And, and, uh, but it, it didn't necessarily seem like a path. You know, there's, there's plenty to, to daydream about and plenty to dream about. And, um, and I think I always wanted to be an actor, you know, I thought that that would be, you know, my, my end goal. Um, and, and even more so, I think early at an early, early age, I, I defined what I wanted to be was a storyteller. I wanted to, to be a storyteller, whether it be painting or sculpture or acting or whatever. Um, but you know, coming towards the end of high school, you're like, Oh, well, what do I do? How do I do this? And, uh, I was in Hinesville, Georgia, because my father was in the army and we were stationed at a military base, uh, Fort Stewart, right next to it, which is attached to Hinesville. And Hinesville was exactly what it sounds like, Hinesville. You know, it was this small Georgia town that had very little cultural, you know, uh, influx and, and very few roads out. Uh, so I joined the army. Um, even though my father expressly said, this is not a good idea. Don't do that. <laughs> don't, don't join the army. It's not for you. Um, but I joined because <clears throat> it was a path. Uh, it, was, it, was an, it was an easy path. It was an illustrated path. And it made that progressive sense. You know, I needed money for college. The army will pay for college. I'll, you know, this, this will just, you know, be the path that I take. However, <laughs> the army was not for me. It was terrible. <laughs> and, uh, and, and in in that period of time, uh, and, and right after getting out of the army, I, I, I took on several like survival jobs. You know, the, the jobs that you take because you know you got to pay the rent, you got to pay the you know these salesman jobs, and 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 you know finding yourself in these sort of um, I don't want to call them dreary, but uh, monotonous. These monotonous existences that we find ourselves in because. It is accepted and it is what we're supposed to do. You know, how do you pay your bills? You get a job, you do your nine to five, you pay your bills and, and, and the rut sets in. You know, you find yourself now following this path. But my passion for storytelling never went away. And, uh, and in, the, in, the, in the really dark hours that were after uh, being in the military... I found myself losing sight of who I wanted to be and just accepting who I was, you know, um, and that is a, that is a dangerous way to live, losing sight of who you want to be, because the longer you put off being who you want to be, the further away from it you get, you know, you're, you, you start down a road that is not where you want to be, who you want to be, how you want to be, you know, uh, it, and it's, it's insidious because it's a simple series of decisions that, that lay right in front of you. You, you. you say, I will do this one thing and it will, it will get me to tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes and you'll say, well, I'll do this small thing. And each one is a step away from where you want to be. Um, luckily, uh, my sister was in town. Uh, we, we ended up in Savannah, Georgia, which was really weird because I thought I would never come back to Georgia. Um, <laughs> but uh, my sister was like, I'm not moving again. You know, she was sick of moving. We moved all our lives. Uh, you know, we had moved, you know, 16 times before we were 16. And, you know, it's just our whole life had been uh, transitory. And I thought that would be my life forever. I thought, surely 
I would always move every two to three years. That would be just the way of things. Um, however, my sister was like, no more. I'm, I'm digging in. And, and she dug in. And, uh, and she was on her way to being a psychiatrist. So she was like pre-med. She was you know, doing the whole thing. And one day she said, I want to be an actress. And it was just one of those things because I was counting on her to be the responsible one so that I could like slack off so that I would not, you know, get the, you know, uh, the knowing glances from my parents and the, the judgment. Um, but she decided she wanted to be an actress. And so uh, we, we went down to a local community theater. We auditioned um, and we found ourselves suddenly in a community. We were suddenly a part of a group of creators and a group of, of dreamers and a group of people who really wanted to, again, make the world a better place because that's what art does. You know, it, 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 it's sometimes painful. Sometimes it's, it's dark. Sometimes it, you know, um, it tells stories that are hard to hear. But the, the final result is, of course, a better world. Because more people get to experience it and then they share the experience. When an entire audience is breathing the same breath and, and crying the same tears and having the same moment all together, that is a, 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 a wonderful congregation that you've created. And when they walk out of the theater, having shared that experience, each of them goes away connected to each other. And you know, you're creating this wonderful net. So, you know, we got to see day by day these wonderful things happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, you find yourself doing the day job, but also doing your, you know, uh, your passion, you know. And, and, and unfortunately, that's how people get into the idea that acting is a hobby, that, you know, theater is a hobby, that, you know, all of it is just, you know, uh, something you do in your social time, something you do for social, you know, uh, networking and, and, and just to hang out with your friends and things like that. And so as time went on, uh, I found myself doing more and more intriguing work. Uh, I, I, I got to be a puppeteer. So I've been a puppeteer for about 30 years now. Love it. You know, I got to travel all around the country doing puppets, having a wonderful time. And puppeteering taught me so much about art and acting and expectations because people have expectation. When you say, you know, I'm putting on a puppet show, their expectation is, you know, kid's birthday party <laughs> and things like that. But, you know, I've seen truly life-changing puppet shows, show, puppet shows that dealt with such uh, intense themes and such intense, uh, you know, material that, you know, you, 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 you can change people's lives. And so it's like, okay, you know, puppets aren't just you know, the kitty stuff and, and puppets aren't just for uh, entertainment. You can uh, educate, you can emote, you can, you can do things with puppets that you can't necessarily do face to face because th there's a cushion. And, and it's funny because that's where I learned that when I'm acting through a puppet and I'm using my hands to act, I feel safe from judgment. So now I'm free because they can't see me. They see the puppet. And I think a lot of people think that's what's happening when they act, is that people can't see me. It's like, well, yeah, I know they're looking at you. You know, that, that's what, they, they do see you. So you have to fill the entire character. Otherwise, the distance between the surface of the character and the person performing the character is going to be obvious, and you're going to look like a bad actor. So um, I... I, I started doing that. I started writing a lot uh, for stage. And, and in playwriting, I was playwriting not because I, I had this great passion to be a playwright, but because there were stories that I wanted told or there were holes in our, in our season and we didn't have money to pay for a script. <laughs> and, you know, so we're like, uh, what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, I worked for a, 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 like a children's theater and we did like two big shows a year that took up all the money we had but our contract was to do like seven to ten shows 
So we're, we're constantly trying to come up with product and come up with content and things like that. And that led to writing for, for television and writing for films and finding myself in, in larger and larger circles, pretty much doing the same thing, just finding my way through connection and connectiveness to tell stories for people. Um, which leads me to last year, uh, me and a friend of mine, a filmmaking friend of mine, we're, 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 we're lamenting because we, we made short films uh, the 48 hour film festival we we we, we you know participated in a few times but we found that what we have in savannah savannah is a big um movie town lots of people film here because we can kind of disguise savannah as a lot of different places at a lot of different times so you see a lot of like civil war because we have old buildings and old streets and things like that um but what we have in savannah are a bunch of professionals who have to wait for a movie to come in and set up for a TV show to show up so that they can get work. And then there's a fever of work and then it stops. And then we're waiting again. And people have moved here because the industry suggested that this is a place of, of, of high content, but now, you know, they are very hand to mouth existence. And I was like, well, if we have so much talent, you know, in front of the camera, behind the camera, why aren't we just going for it? Why aren't we producing? Why aren't we creating, you know, uh, much in the way that a community theater does? Why aren't we rolling camera? Why aren't we getting the people that we know can act, getting the people we know uh, can crew, putting them all together and making things? So we, we, we did a first, our first feature in August. We, we just got it together and we said, let's do it. Let's, let's, let's do it. And we, you know, it was a, uh, I, I will say a zero budget, but it really cost us about $4,000. Which is a zero budget to you know anybody in in the industry. Um, however, out of your pocket, you're like, oh, <laughs> you know, I, I could be buying a used car. Um, so there was definitely uh, this notion that, and and again, if you're out there listening and thinking that it's all far away from you, it is not. Uh, anything that you really want to achieve, especially acting, producing, directing. Um, Right now, the vast majority of the population of this country carries in their pocket a better camera than has been used in films for 80 years of filmmaking. You got to realize that the camera on my iPhone is stupid. It's, it's incredible. And, and the idea that we have these tools ready-made with us 90% of the time uh, should tell you one thing, and that's you can be in charge of that particular destiny. Because uh, when you start thinking of creation and you start thinking of movies, everybody immediately leaps to this idea of, of scope, huge scope, these big, gigantic movies. But the, the true trick of a big, gigantic movie is if it doesn't have the very small insular relationship they fail. There's no amount of CGI, there's no amount of spectacle that's going to make up for two people interacting in a meaningful way. So, you know, if you cannot uh, uh, achieve the grand scope, big, gigantic monster of a movie, keep in mind that none of those movies would work without one person talking to another person and making that connection, or one person influencing another person and making that connection. So, you know, get your phones out, you know, tell your stories and, and work at it. Because uh, I'll tell you right now, the movie we made in August is horrible. It's, it's not a good movie. Uh, but a lot of that has to do with time restriction, with, with, with having to figure out all these little pieces. Because a, a movie is a huge thing and, and lots of moving people, uh, lots of moving pieces. We had a crew of five and a, a, a cast of seven. And so, you know, as we, as we move through it, we're like, okay, I'm learning. I learned so much from doing that, so I, we are gearing up for our next movie. Taking what we learned from that first movie, and we're like, you know what? And, and now we're asking for a budget. Now we're like, okay, this is what we could do with nothing. Let's see what we can do with, you know, like $20,000. Let's see, let's see what kind of movie we can make with that because we're passionate enough, but more than that, once you have, you know, a tribe, once you have a group of people who are willing to go out on a limb with you, go out on that limb. You know, 
there is, there is no shame in failing the attempt. The shame is not attempting. So, you know, I, I always want people to, to know that we are not limited by, uh, by, our, by financial situation. We're not limited by location. We're limited by our own doubt and our own fear and our own, you know, inner voice that says, well, that's never going to work. Um, it's okay if it doesn't work. I, I, we, we've gotten obsessed with this idea that failure is the worst thing that can happen to you. It's like, no, nothing is the worst thing that can happen to you. Failure means that something happened, that you, you, you tried something, that you did something, and in the end, you'll have a story to tell and you'll be a storyteller. You, know? <laughs> you will have that story to tell about that time that you tried to make a movie and, 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 and what uh, various obstacles came in the way and, and what you learned at the end and, and, and you know, what friendships were formed and what friendships were lost. There's so much going on with any endeavor, and I, I urge everyone to, to dare. You know, um, it's so weird because I think at one point uh, I had talked to somebody who, uh, <laughs> who wanted to become a dermatologist. And I thought, is it because you're passionate about skin? And his answer was, no, they just get paid a lot. You know, a, a dermatologist gets paid a lot. And I was like, that is a safe and, and fair determination. You, fa- you picked a profession and, 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 and pursued a skill, and uh, you're going to make a paycheck. But does that fulfill you? Are you fulfilled? And what happens, you know, at the end of the day? And that does, it, 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 it's, it's kind of heartbreaking because years and years later, well into his dermatology career, <laughs> I had talked to him and I asked him, you know, what's his day like? And it's like, I wake up, I go to work, I come home and then I'm, I'm done for the day. And it was like two weeks out of the year, he goes on a vacation. Uh, and, it, and I was like, I understand that you're providing for yourself and I understand that you're comfortable and, and, and kudos to everybody who's doing that. But where's, where's your dream? You know, where's your passion? Was your dream really to, to come home at night, every night at a level of exhaustion and, and sit and that would be it. You know, that, that would be the peak of your existence. Um, because I don't know if, if, and, and, you know, that's not to say that he doesn't have professional accolades or, or that he's not achieving things, but in that conversation, I heard nothing about his passion or his, you know, where the reward was in what he did. So, um, so it is one of those things where you have to really carefully and cautiously think, am I what I do? Um, you know, because that's, that's this interesting question when people say, what are you versus what do you do? And a lot of people will answer the same thing. What are you? You know, I'm a dentist. What do you do? I'm a dentist. Should those two things be synonymous? And if they're not synonymous, how can you alleviate the difference? You know, <laughs> what, what, what do you do? Uh, you know, I like to think that if somebody asks me, who I, who I am, I'm a storyteller. And then they ask me, what do I do? And I'll say, well, I write scripts and poetry. I act on stage. I puppeteer. I paint pictures. I sculpt sculptures. I, you know, I do all these things specifically. I make movies uh, as a means to justify me saying I'm a storyteller. Uh, one should support the other, but maybe one shouldn't be the other. A couple things that I thought about. The first one I'm wondering, when you're, when you're wanting to make, create, right? The biggest thing that blocked in my brain as soon as you started saying, just dare to do this, just who cares if you fail and stuff like that, is, is perfectionism. Because I think so many of us, especially the people I chat with, who are coming at this from another career. And I wonder if you felt similar, like, 
with your military career and my career in medicine where like perfectionism is almost a necessity because if you're not perfect air quotes you know legitimate things can go wrong you know i think about accountants like you need to be perfect because then the company collapses if you aren't so trying to shift that mindset from don't see failure as shame because for 30 years of my life that's what failure is was how do you how do you do that? How do you change that? How do you get over that massive speed bump that I seem to be ramming my head against? So it's it's very interesting because um, in 2020, <laughs> just a month before the pandemic, uh, I undertook a a an exercise. I called it an exercise in completion. Um, in my computer were dozens, if not hundreds of unfinished projects, scripts that stalled out, stories that stalled out, things that I wanted to do, but the perfectionist bug, that it's not perfect, it's not coming out perfect, it's not, it's not the way I want it to be, it's not you know, uh, working, uh, somehow stalled all of these projects, and I would read them and think, this isn't bad. You know, I, I gave up on it, and somehow I justified it by using the perfect uh, excuse. And uh, the phrase that I use, oh, and, and so what I, I did was, uh, regardless of anything, uh, for the year 2020, I would write a complete feature-length screenplay every week. Oh. I would sit down and I would just write a complete feature-length screenplay. Uh, and actually, it was technically every five days. Every five days, Monday through Friday, I would write, and on Friday, every Friday, I would have a completed script. Uh, and I was able to say, these aren't going to be good. You know, I'm fine with that because the, my mantra, and, and this is the mantra that I use for all of this, is an imperfect nothing is greater than a perfect something. No, backwards. A imperfect something is greater than a perfect nothing. Because a perfect nothing is what we're really achieving when we stop ourselves. When we stop ourselves, we're trying to maintain this perfection but it doesn't exist. We're literally standing in the way of trying to achieve anything because it's not perfect. Um, and when you talk about uh, medical field, military, uh, accounting, um, it's actually precision is what you're talking about and not perfection. Oh. And that becomes this, and it is because, because failure of precision can lead to calamity. But being precise is not the same as being perfect because we ascribe perfection as a different sensation and a different thing. And the truth of the matter is there's no such thing as perfect. The only thing we have is what is or what is not. Did we create something or did we not create something? And you can say, I put it off because it wasn't right, because it didn't fit, because it wasn't working. I was like, yeah, then it doesn't exist. Then it doesn't matter. <laughs> and if you want it to matter, then it has to be there. Something has to be there. And the concept of failure, again, only uh, exists uh, if you can measure it. You know, if you, if you say, my, uh, my success is making a million dollars. And if I don't make a million dollars, I'm a failure. That is such a, uh, a rigged game that you've set up for yourself. You're not, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna win that game. That game is going to crush you. Uh, so to me, I changed the stakes. I changed what perfection meant to me. Perfection to me is a complete thing, no matter how flawed. A perfection to me is, um, you know, landing the gig. That's perfect because I went out and I got it. Now, the next stage will be execute it and execute it to the best of my abilities. But spend no time trying to make it perfect because the pursuit of perfection is actually the obstacle. The pursuit of perfection keeps us from achieving. People think that we're driven to be perfect, but the truth of the matter is we're driven away from accomplishment 
by chasing perfection. We would rather chase perfection to oblivion than achieve something that we would deem subpar or substandard. And the truth of the matter is, it's kind of up to other people. Mm. Because, especially in, in the field of art, if I create something and I say, this is perfect, guess what? Not everybody's going to agree with it. There's plenty of people out there who will argue. As a matter of fact, there are whole YouTube channels devoted to arguing the various degrees of perfection of different things. It does not have to be perfect for everyone. It does not even have to be perfect for yourself. But it does have to be out there. And I think that that... It's, that's, it sounds so uh, counterintuitive to suggest that you not fear failure <laughs> and you, 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 you not strive for you know, perfection, um, but you just have to change the definition. What makes something perfect? You know, what, what does make something perfect? And... You know, if, if, if you've ever been in a, a long-term relationship, every day is perfect if it ends with you together. Hmm. And people forget to note how incredible it is that being in a relationship is two separate beings agreeing at the end of the day that they're still together. <laughs> you know, that, 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 that tomorrow is another day together. And, uh, and that's the truth of anything you do is if you, if you change the definition of perfection to uh, uh, the check mark, I've completed the task, check, perfect. But if you spend all your time thinking that it's going to be flawless and without, you know, uh, because that'll drive you crazy. You'll just go nuts. You know, uh, and I and I see this. Uh, it, there's a there's a fatigue in acting, where people work so hard on all of these notions and and try to 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 inform every choice and try to do all these things, and they they basically suck all the joy out of acting in in pursuit of perfection, in pursuit of this you know flawless performance. And it's like, well, you know. You are the only person that needs to be satisfied by what you do. Mm. And it sounds selfish, but it's the absolute truth that, um, and, and, you know, I've, I've taught a lot of writing classes. One of the first things I always say is when you're writing, you are the first person to read this. Make sure you like it. Make sure you're writing something that you want to read. Because a lot of people will write something that they think someone else wants to read. And a lot of people will write uh, in the fashion of someone that they aspire to be like. And that's, that's not going to get you anywhere. You know, um, that's only going, to, well, that's only going to get you so far. You have to really be the first audience. You know, you have to be the first audience to when you act. Because you're, you, you're putting it on in your head when you're learning your lines. You're putting it on for yourself and you have to be satisfied. And people spend more time being dissatisfied than satisfied. And that's a choice. You know, that's a, that's a solid choice. You're, you're choosing to dwell on the stumbled line or the stumbled moment. Or you're, you're dwelling on not s sticking the landing, so to speak. Um, but again, now we're dealing with... Precision versus perfection. The perfect thing is getting it done. How precise you do it is a matter of work. You know, how hard are you going to work on it? That is so inspiring. And <laughs> it's, it's inspiring. It's, a, it's funny. I was like, what are all the emotions I'm feeling right now? I feel inspired. I feel relieved. Because I think that the the weight of perfectionism, and honestly, the weight of precision, right, is a is a, a heavy cross to bear. That sounds so dramatic, but but I think as soon it's true, right? As soon as you, I, I agree. As soon as you take the pressure off impressing other, and think about what you're doing for yourself as selfish as that feels, like you're like you were saying that that's 
that's all the pressure gone. Because if you can't impress yourself, like, come on, like, <laughs> figure out how to impress yourself. Be in love with what you do. You know, and, and, and that, you know, that does not have to be about creating art or doing uh, or being an actor or anything like that. It's literally in anything you do. Uh, if you're a barista, if you're a, you know, a surgeon, if you're, whatever it is, if you're not inspiring yourself through interaction, through, uh, you know, making your days uh, mean something to yourself, you know, and, and people will, will always talk about, you know, the um, the mundane tasks and the heightened tasks and and the mundane jobs and the heightened jobs and the truth of the matter is, if you find yourself in that mundane world in the you know um, uh, standing at a cash register or or doing something that most people deem to be you know just uh, that uh, gig you know world where you're you're trying to make your paycheck, just remember that. When you're at work, that's not you. Reach out, reach beyond, do something in that free time. Because, you know, what, what, what invariably happens to a lot of people I know is they, they do the job and then when they get off of work, they try to escape all the drudgery of the job that they just did. And that usually spells it out as, you know, going to a bar or hanging out or, or, or just trying to, to justify being alive when the work isn't satisfying them. And the, and the point is, you need to satisfy yourself. Be satisfied. Do something that brings you satisfaction. Uh, and, and there is a wide thing. I'm not even saying that it, you know, going out and drinking with friends isn't satisfying, because I think maybe that is to people. Uh, it, it's, it's not to me, but if that social circle that you're building and, it, and that tight-knit group of friends and you go out and you have a great time, if that is what's satisfying you, then you are participating in life and not uh, justifying the hours you work. Uh, but if you can find jobs that give you the opportunity to feel satisfaction, you know, and if you're in a job that seems like drudge work, find avenues in that job to suggest satisfaction. You know, maybe it is a a, a brighter interaction with coworkers or with the public. Maybe it is uh, being creative in a field that is not normally recognized for creativity. But I do think that we, we were raised thinking that our, our duty is to others. But it's very hard to satisfy other people uh, especially in, in any work environment, because everybody has to have their own individual, you know, machinations going on. So satisfy yourself. Be aware that it's not selfish to want to be happy and to be productive. Those are not selfish thoughts. That is you wanting to contribute to the point at which you yourself feel better, you know, feel more whole. Don't don't let don't let life punch holes in you without filling them in with something, you know. Um, and yeah, yeah, I, I think that 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 probably glosses over a lot of you know depressive states, a lot of of difficulties that you're going to encounter in your life. But I do think that we should always be looking to fill the holes with something constructive, productive. Um, and I always turn to art. I always think art is the answer. Uh, storytelling is the answer to when life is punching holes in you. When life is punching holes in you, punch back with a story or punch back with some method of informing other people how you feel because people underestimate how valuable that is. You know, uh, if you write a poem about a, a depressive episode due to exhaustion at work, there are people out there who need to see that and hear that and, and know that they're not alone. Uh, if, you, if you perform in a play as a, as, a, as a character who is going through you know, loss or you know, uh, a grief of any type, people in the audience, they, they are feeling you know, those things. They, there are people who seek out 
the sad movie or the sad story because it is a commiserate human experience. They're saying, oh, I am not alone. Someone else has felt this and expressed it, and now I'm not alone. So never underestimate the value of telling people they're not alone, uh, which I think is the, the point of storytelling, is to ensure that we all know that the human condition is universal, that the human condition is not um, you know, only for people who can afford to have it. <laughs> is there anything that you are looking forward to coming up projects you have going on? Well, like I said, uh, <laughs> we lined up a, a second feature. Uh, we are talking to, um, to investors right now, and, and it's all looking very promising. Uh, the beauty of it is, and I find this to be true, and, and maybe I'm just stupid lucky in my life. Uh, it's possible. It's possible that I'm just stupid lucky. But the truth of the matter is, when you find something that you're passionate about and you start pursuing it, other people will show up in your life to facilitate it, to, to, to uh, almost like a, a sign that you're on the right path. You know, um, the idea that when, you, when you're going towards a goal, are the doors opening or are they closing? If the doors are opening, you're on the right path. If they're closing, you might need to rethink your approach. And I am lucky enough to, to have my doors flinging open in front of me. Um, and a lot of that has to do with a long time of building relationships and a long time of working in a field where people recognize me and say, oh, you're the storyteller, you're the writer, you're the actor, you're the X, Y, and Z. Because what they recognize is that when I pursue my passion, I achieve some level of that passion. I, 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 I get to the, the product. Um, and that's, you know, a, a mercenary way of putting it um, is to say, when you're storytelling, when you're doing this, when you're acting, when you're doing that, anything, you are actually creating a product. And that product will be consumed by others. Do not let things get in the way of the product, of, of getting that product at the end. Because the product at the end is the only thing that is going to be uh, consumed. You know, um, and, and if, you, if you fall short of the product, make another product. Make a product out about not getting that product made. You know, <laughs> find ways to uh, you know, uh, facilitate the journey towards completion. Um, so I, 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 I again, I, I might just be stupid lucky. <laughs> because I live a very gifted and happy life. Um, when, uh, when I got out of the Army and when I, I did, you know, very briefly attempted a normal life. Uh, what I learned very, very early on was don't do a job you don't love. Just don't. There may be days you don't love. There may be things about the job you don't love. But if you don't love the job, don't do it. You've got to enjoy your life. And let's say there is a job you don't love, but you can find aspects to love. Pursue the things you love about anything, any situation you're in. And if you cannot find something you love, leave. Go away. <laughs> get another job. Uh, uh, people get so stuck in that pattern of thought that, you know, it's all about security and securing this, you know, very tenuous success. And the truth of the matter is, no. Uh, change your definition of success. Mm. Change your definition of perfection. Look towards being happy. Look towards, because when you are happy, you become a source of happiness for others. Ooh. When you exhibit being happy, other people use it as an example. Uh, I have a friend who is a <laughs> brilliant puppeteer. She's an amazing woman, but she's always happy. And so one day, out of sheer awe of her, I asked her, how are you always so happy? Because, you know, the world is not a particularly happy place, but every time I encountered her, every time we spoke, every time we saw each other, she was beaming and glowing, and, and everyone is drawn to her because she exudes happiness. And her answer to me blew me away because she said, I choose to be. 
And it, that broke my brain. It, it absolutely broke my brain because I wanted to be offended by that. I wanted to be like, what do you mean you choose? You know, the world is, is such a crappy place and, you know, so much hardship and so much horror and so many things and, and, and uh, chemistry and blah, blah, blah. You know, I wanted to do that, but standing in front of her, all I could say was, that's beautiful. How beautiful that you look in the mirror in the morning and you say, today I choose to be happy. And, you know, that's not to say she doesn't get angry and it's not to say that things don't upset her. It's just that she, she makes these conscious efforts to be happy. And, um, and that might be why she's a very successful puppeteer, you know, because puppeteering makes her happy and she pursued it and she, she followed up on it. So, um, so choose happiness. You know, uh, and that, and, and I, I, I find it hard to believe that there aren't people out there who don't want to be actors. You know, I find it hard to believe that there are people out there who don't want to, you know, do these creative art things. Um, I'm sure there are. I know there are. Uh, but um, that doesn't mean that there's not something that makes you happy, that that's, there's not something that you could be doing more actively to be happy. Do you have any final words of wisdom? This has been all, like just like a therapy session for me. <laughs> but no pressure. Do you have any more? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think I think the overriding message that I always have is do it. Do the thing. You know, um and while while it for me it, it, it applies to to art, storytelling, filmmaking, acting, uh, while to me it, it, it applies to those things, um, whatever it is to you, you know, uh, think about those things that we shelve because we grew up, you know, quote unquote, grew up. Think of those things that 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 we daydreamed about as kids and and really look at what it was about those things. Because I find it interesting, you know, a lot of people will get into a field. Uh, let's say, I know a guy who was a, who's an archaeologist. And when I asked him, why are you an archaeologist? He said, you know, Indiana Jones, uh, Raiders of Lost Ark. And I was like, oh, interesting that you went into the profession of a character in a movie. Have you ever thought that you'd want to just portray the profession <laughs> in a movie? You know, uh, the movie inspired you to take on, you know, incredible uh, school student loan debt and, <laughs> and, and pursue this, this very, you know, uh, uh, precision-filled, you know, field. Uh, but that was, his dream was to be Indiana Jones. And, and he took those steps to be more like the person that he idolized. And so I'm like, think back to the dreams. Think back to those things. And there's an answer somewhere in there. Even if it isn't the profession itself, there's an answer in your dreams, in the dreams of old, the dreams that we put in boxes and said, I'm too old for this. We are not too old. Never. We're never too old. As long as you draw a breath, as long as you can think, you are not too old to dust off your dreams and examine them. What about those dreams really brought you joy or wonder or made you want to pursue them in the first place. And you might be surprised because it might be, I saw it in a movie or I saw it on TV or I, I read about it in a book, which might suggest you need to make a TV show, make a movie, write a book. That might be somewhere in your path because the things that influenced you to do whatever it is you do or influenced you to dream what you wanted to do you can be the captain of. You can take over that ship and, and guide other people towards their dreams. It's never too late to chase a dream. And again, there's no such thing as failure in chasing your dreams outside of not chasing them. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And thank you, Chris, for being my guest this week. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to chat with me and just explore our mutual love of story and help me develop that 
even further. I so appreciate you. Thank you everyone for tuning in and I hope you'll join me next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye. Second Act Actors is produced and edited by me, Janet McMorty. Theme music by Guillaume. Additional sound editing by David Studio. Additional video editing by Jackie Wadewer. Show notes written by Sarah Hopkinson. I record using Riverside FM. If you're interested in developing an interview-based webcast like mine, I highly recommend this platform. Shoot me an email and I'll direct you to the wonderful folks there. If you or someone you know is interested in being a guest, email me at secondactactors at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. My love language is words of affirmation, so compliments, constructive criticism, and feedback are always welcome and encouraged. Negative Nancys, Judgy McJudgersons, or Debbie Downers, unless you're Rachel Dratch, regarding me or my guests are not welcome. It takes serious courage to share your story with the world, so if you're tempted to negatively comment about someone else's story, please ask your therapist why you're such a garbage person. Save the drama for the stage. On that happy note, I hope you'll tune in next week for another episode of Second Act Actors. Bye!